Good morning and welcome to another edition of 15 Minutes of Flame. This is Robert Phoenix. Broadcasting, of course, live as much as I can. I guess if I'm not broadcasting live, you're going to have to figure out what happened to me. <laughs> no, I, I do, do rebroadcast re every now and then. What if I was, hi, Robert Phoenix, broadcasting to you from my spiritual body since I've left my physical body here in Austin, Texas, but I managed to get in one more transmission before I check out of here and uh, start uh, exploring some other dimensions. <laughs> anyway, the birds are back. I love hearing the birds. The birds are back. Here we got bird song. Isn't that lovely? It's a great comfort to me to know that the birds are singing. It gives some semblance of order to the universe just to hear a simple bird song. But, and it's incredible to me. It's like these pe these little little beings, these little creatures, they're just living their lives, man. <laughs> they're living their lives, they're flying around. You know, they get into squabbles every now and then. Uh, they're always on kind of a pursuit for whatever berries or worms or seeds or whatever they eat and that's okay because there's plenty out there they have to deal with the funky chemtrails just like the rest of us but I'd say they have pretty good lives completely and utterly unaffected for the most part by the bullshit and the jive waxing poetically about birds so what's happening out there it's uh, another day in the neighborhood. Apparently now the Parkland City All-Stars, also known as Cameron Kasky, David Hogg, and Emma Gonzalez, plus the blonde girl who doesn't stand out enough to for us to remember her name, are getting ready to return to school. Although Kevin Hogg may not return until serious, serious gun legislation is passed. Well, I was on with uh, Randy and Emily and uh, Jenny Moonstone, who lives 40 minutes away from Parkland and went to that high school. So she was on there with uh, Randy and Emily and kind of talking about what life is like in Parkland and what the school is like and what her experience there was like. And it was interesting. It's very interesting. You can tell this young woman's been through a lot. So she did the first hour with Randy and Emily, and then uh, then I came on, and I brought a few little goodies. And uh, I, I've been, you know, I'm intrepid. I'm intrepid. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's a personality defect. Maybe it's just the uh, the Scorpio rising. Maybe that's what it is. So I've been uh, scouring the internet. And uh, yesterday I was uh, on Godlike Productions, hanging out in their, their forum. <laughs> Find some interesting stuff in there. It's kind of like a precursor to uh, 4chan, 8chan, Paul, uh, to some extent, read it. But it definitely has a, a conspiratorial or darker angle to it. Most of them, I'd say 90, 99% are males, most of them probably between the age of 35 and 19 or something like that. You get the picture. 
So I was on there and I, I found a really interesting photo of Kevin Hogg. And Kevin is wearing a graduation gown. And the graduation gown is of a particular color. It is a, kind of a, a, pink, a pinkish, reddish, rosish color. And it is the uh, color of a school called Redondo Union. And he's in a photo with his mother, Rebecca. And it's a fairly close-up photo, but you can tell that he's wearing his graduation gown. I think I talked about it yesterday, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, he he's wearing also a lay of, like, it looks like candies or something. It's it's a looks slightly Asian. Anyway, there are other photos that are and have surfaced from at the actual same graduation event, which took place in 2014. And there are uh, guys and women wearing the same kinds of graduation gowns, same color lays festooned with the same things around their necks. And I found these photos separately through the chat room. And then somebody put them together and now they're, it's on the internet. How long it's going to stay up now, I, I don't know. But I brought this to the attention of Randy and Emily and uh, Jenny last night. And so we looked at it. And there are some markers inside the photos which pretty clearly suggest that it, it's at the same place, okay? Now, the only thing that might be a discrepancy in the photo is if that is his eighth grade graduation photo. It's a possibility. Possibility. But the, in that photo, he does not look like an eighth grader. And clearly, he, to me, he does not look like a high school senior now. He looks older as a high school senior, to me. That's just to me. So if that's the case, then Ke uh, Ke Sorry, David Hogg, then David Hogg would be four years older than his actual age, which would put him around 22, and that he had actually uh, re-enrolled at Parkland School maybe a year ago. When did they move there? 2015, I think, 2015? I think so. So there was probably a year where um, David Hogg was off. And again, pure speculation on my part. But I also have some instincts, and they're pretty good most of the time. So my instincts are, and speculation is, is that he took some time out to go through some kind of training, media training, articulation, whatever. And he took a year off to get honed so that when they called his number, which is being called now, that he'd be ready to go and uh, step into the limelight and know exactly what to do and be very clear about what the objectives are and the whole nine yards. Okay. Uh, that's my sense. Now I found a few other photos that have some pretty interesting discrepancies as well. Apparently there's a, a survivor who matches up with a 25 year old graduate student from a uh, graduating student or graduated student from Florida State. And you'll see these photos in the broadcast with Randy and Emily, which will probably not be on YouTube. Um, they'll have a teaser and a chaser, and it'll tell you where to go to see the video. It's going to be very interesting to see what happens moving forward with YouTube, because it feels to me like we're witnessing the, the death of YouTube. Now, I'm sure it's going to go on and it'll have Logan Paul, who's back in the fold now. <laughs> They've re-embraced Logan Paul. Um, they'll have stuff like that, and they'll have plenty of material, plenty, plenty, plenty of material to counter or 
uh, create a, 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 an alternative narrative or, you know, I mean, it'll still exist. Don't get me wrong, there's too much money behind YouTube, which we, we know is owned by Google, right? It's owned by Google. So the death of YouTube that I'm referring to, though, is the death of what was once YouTube, which at one point in time was the freaking Wild West. I mean, before Google got its claws on YouTube, it was YouTube was interesting. I mean, that's the way it is with everything on the internet. eBay was interesting at one time, believe it or not. Now it's all pretty much... They're trying to turn themselves into Amazon is what they're trying to do. But initially, eBay was really fascinating. You could find some crazy stuff being sold on eBay. Um, but this is what happens with the internet. Something starts off, it's really interesting, and it explodes, and there's this you know, energy and the surge, and all of a sudden becomes commodified or becomes too potent or too too uh, too charged, and all of a sudden they've got to delete, uh, dilute, and in the case of YouTube, delete. So, where else did we see? MySpace was kind of a precursor to that. MySpace was pretty hot. MySpace was dynamic. It was, it was a really, when MySpace hit, it was a pretty cool platform. And there were a lot of outlaws and there were a lot of people exchanging very interesting information on MySpace. And of course, what happens? Well, they got bought. They got bought by Rupert Murdoch and and then MySpace was never really the same after that. Enter Facebook. So as my fa MySpace, my, my face, wouldn't that be a good website? My face, kind of like my face and face, my space and Facebook, my face for all your biometric needs. Is your biometric locker, your biometric locker website, my face. <laughs> So Facebook took over. Facebook has been a little bit more lenient with the material, although my friend Lawrence is always getting shut down for posting stuff. It's because Lawrence is such a great Facebook connector. Connects with a lot of people, puts up a lot of content. I mean, they should just hire Lawrence, to be quite honest with you. But uh, he's getting shut down a lot, or has been. It's been pretty pretty lenient in terms of being able to put. I put up a lot of material on Facebook, and I'd say they let me get away with it. I'm not sure why. I'm not that important. Um, I don't have a four thousand followers. I've got I think two thousand. Although I was I was um, accused of being a cult leader yesterday. A cult leader. Yeah. There's this guy who started to attack me on the uh, Kevin Hogg stuff. I'm sorry, I keep calling him Kevin. David Hogg. And he was very aggressive, shall we say. <laughs> I, mean, I looked at his Facebook page. He's like, he kind of scary looking dude in his own way, right? It's like, okay. You know that's, you know, you look at a guy and you ask yourself, you know, can I handle that guy? <laughs> if I had to, can I, I don't know. I don't know. I'd have to summon a lot of rage or get into my Mars cancer protective mode. Because when I have to protect somebody, I can, I can, even at 57 years old, I can, I can probably do a pretty decent job. Although for how long, I don't know. <laughs> uh, it would be limited. Anyway, this guy was really aggressive. And, uh, and I responded to him a couple times. And it's like, yeah, I'm going to cut him off now. I'm going to shut him down. Why? Because I can just, where's it going to go? Where, where is it going to go? Is it going to be, oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. No, oh, yeah, you're right, too. God, if I could reach across that screen, I'd hug you, brother. I'd hug you, too. Those days are over, man. I mean, I'd love for that to happen, but it just doesn't seem like that kind of kumbaya is, is out there. So I got a, an email from him yesterday accusing me of being a cultist that the people that respond to my posts are cult members. Well, I don't know about that. I certainly don't fit the uh, the cult profile. Not in the least. We got some uh, action in the chat room today. What do we have? Uh, 
Last two shows were not uploaded to YouTube. Oh. Well, that's interesting because I did hit the queue and I'll try to upload them again today. That's interesting. Uh, well, we'll try it again today with YouTube. So I wanted to talk about, I'm, I'm not going to burn for a long time today. I mean, I'm, I may just go for probably about 30 minutes, but I wanted to talk about what's happening socially and how we're being entrained to talk or not talk about events based on what's happening in Florida. And, I, and I've been you know talking about this for a while now, or at least it seems like it's, we're two weeks in. But it seems like the whole Florida event just happened yesterday in a lot of ways. So we're two weeks into it and it, the impression or the feeling that I get around this is that this has become, Florida has become the new Holocaust. It's the new Holocaust. Um, it is the new sort of standard for anti-Semitism. Uh, even though we can talk about Florida and Parkland in a way that embraces neither of those events or um, ideologies, brands. And yet, the reaction is still the same, which is immediate censure. Absolute immediate censure. You know, I made a joke on uh, Facebook about, uh, you know, why is it they leave the QAnon channels alone? Well, that's not the case anymore. QAnon was just fine until Jerome Corsi posted a photo or that Q had sent Corsi about the Florida thing. And as soon as that happened, boom, it was over, it was done, gone. And I think Corsi removed everything from YouTube. So this is a really big deal, a really, really big deal. Uh, and of course, this all started with Paul Joseph Watson back in the summertime, early, early summer, late spring, when they were, you know, banning his videos. Now he's gone, and well, that's history. It's total history. So this is what's happening now. We're we're taking, and and if you, um, if you look at the slogans for Parkland, they're very reminiscent of the Holocaust. They're using like Holocaust, like never again, you know, never again. That's kind of a, a Holocaust sort of mantra, right? Never forget, never forget, never again. So they're, they're kind of blending together. So, so now what we're dealing with in terms of entrainment and timeline is uh, post-war Germany, right around 1947, 1948 Nuremberg trials. So this is another kind of thread that's being woven into this. Now we have post Nuremberg trials, we have the Children's Crusade, and we have the Bolshevik Revolution. All weaving together. And the Children's Crusade, by the way, is, is starting to come up in, it has come up in terms of being able to describe this event. So I thought that that was interesting that uh, other people are picking up on this. It's not that hard. You know, in terms of being able to match a prior event in history, it's not like I have some special gift or anything. But it seemed pretty obvious to me. And, and the uh, and the the thing that I thought was interesting from an astrological perspective were the two elements that were involved here, and we're talking Jupiter and Scorpio and Uranus and Aries, which were taking place at the same time as the Children's Crusade, as it is current day history, albeit with slightly different degrees, but still nonetheless being a part of that. Part of the experience. Um, there's something I wanted to check out here. Give me one second. Okay. Just wanted to look up the ephemeris because I had a, I noticed something uh, yesterday when I was looking up Easter Sunday which is also April Fool's Day. Let's see, what do we have? There's a certain element. Yeah. Okay, what do we have? Mars, Saturn. 
kind of the Mars and Saturn. Yes, that Mars-Saturn conjunction on the 1st of April. 8 degrees, 8 degrees. And then the next big conjunction is going to be the, uh, the Mars-Pluto conjunction, which we had two years ago. And that was at uh, 26, that's a 21, 21, 21, and that's going to be on the uh, 26th and 27th of April. So we had the Mars-Pluto conjunction two years ago. Let me just see what, uh, what day was that. Let's see, hold on. It's going to be around, let me go back in time. Sorry, I'm doing a little bit of this on the fly today because I want to, there's, there's a, something that's kind of kicking around in my head and I'm trying to make a connection with. Let's see, where is it? Right over here. And it has to do with Scalia and the death of Scalia. Let me just look at this. So we're talking 2016. Right there. And we're looking at Mars. So the Mars Pluto conjunction. Let's see. Mars Pluto conjunction. All right. That's going to be. So Pluto was at 15 degrees then. And what do we have here? 15, 15. So it's right around the 31st of August. Uh, that's, hold on, different. All right, I'm getting there. Okay, so it's going to be right around the 15th, 20th of October. 20th of October, 20th of October, that's the last time we went into the Mars-Pluto conjunction. All right, so let's just do a little bit of math here. Let's do this. Or October 20. Give me one sec. All right. I should have saved this for the uh, the time tunnel, but uh, it's okay. So the ten things that happened during that week. Ten things that happened. Let's see. Trump and Clinton exchange sharp attacks in final debate. Uh, let's see what else. Turkey bombs, U.S. backed Kurdish rebels in Syria, U.S. service member, civilian killed in Kabul, uh, former TV reporter accuses Bill Clinton of sexual assaults in the 80s, uh, U.S. militarily says ISIS leaders may have fled Mosul, at least four died in a typhoon in the Philippines. Uh, Theresa May expected to clarify Brexit plan in her first EU summit. Derek Rose was cleared in a rape case, and uh, Cleveland beat Toronto to catch a, catch a World Series spot. I was just trying to get a sense as to what was happening last time. It was, you know, it was a violent time, obviously. Uh, final debate. It was the final debate. Interesting. Well, we're coming up on it, and we're coming up on a new cycle. This is a very different time, obviously than two years ago. Everything has escalated and um, gotten really cranked up. But it's this, it's this Easter weekend that I've got my eye on. April Fool's Day and Easter Sunday. I think we just need to say like a, a real you know, prayer for humanity, to be quite honest with you. Because quite frankly, we need it. You know, this is a, a time where you know, the, our, our country is in, in really difficult straits. We're being torn asunder. We're being pulled in two. And very households are actually uh, suffering the same kind of bifurcation and wrenching sense of duality where people have differing worldviews, differing universal views, differing religious views. And there is no center anymore, really, to hold us all together. And this is a very challenging time. Very challenging time. 
you know, and we're sort of caught in the middle of this clash of ideologies. Most people just want to get along and live and be happy, raise their kids, go on a vacation, get a new car every now and then. That's really basically been the MO for getting along and surviving, but so much has happened to the planet and so many events have taken place where it feels as if we're dealing, you know, not with a, a you know, kind of an evolutionary arc of a society or a culture or a planet, but we're, we're dealing with a, almost a contagion of what feels like interdimensional forces in a lot of ways that are engaged in being, becoming inserted in our events. I mean, that's what it feels like. And you throw AI into the mix, and who knows what's going on behind the scenes with AI, where it's really at, versus, of course, what they always show us, the latest trick that their robot dog can do. And it poses for uh, a pretty different model of reality than we've been used to for a very long time. And what happens in moments like this is that the actual spirit the spirit of God, the spirit of life, and the spirit of love that pervades everything gets pushed out. It gets pushed out because more and more people are engaging with this synthetic force or this synthetic field, the thing that looks like it's supposed to be the thing, but it's not. And so that other force that bonds us, binds us, atoms, molecules of love, it gets pushed out. And connecting with it becomes more and more difficult, to be quite honest with you. And this is what happens. It's always there, but it gets more and more difficult. You really have to reach in to, uh, to find it sometimes. And I think that the, this is a time where we really need to reach in. You know, this country is uh, pretty fractured. And I'm, and I'm being really frank and I'm not being cynical. And I'm not trying to be funny, but it's pretty fractured. And I think we're going to need to have some kind of miracle in a lot of ways to bring us all together. Now, that could be, you know, easily propped up. If they wanted to, I'm sure. I'm sure it could happen. Uh, but, um, and I, th I think that probably the best thing that we can do is do our best. And I, I'm going to raise my hand today. I put my left hand right up in the air. I'm going to do my best to live by that spirit, to bring that loving spirit back into our lives. It's a, it's a, a way that we can interact with people. And I try my best, but every now and then I get triggered. You know, I get triggered, especially when I see bullshit and I've got to call it in my own way. But uh, it is the spiritual acts, it is the spiritual energy, it is the spiritual dynamism, and it is that uh, sacred bond of love that uh, moves us through the universe and says to us, you know, be my hands, be my head, be my eyes, be my feet, be my heart in the world. And this is why we, this is why people, you know, serve. This is why they want to serve. Serving is not some kind of, you know, secular act. I mean, I guess, I guess if you're a bartender at one o'clock in the morning in one of Ernest Hemingway's short stories, you can be elevated in the fact that you are a person that holds back the chaos of somebody else's experience by keeping a clean, well-lighted place. And that's not a bad thing. But there's something bigger here. There's a bigger piece here. And, um, and maybe that might be the best counter-revolutionary force to everything that's going on. Without, without turning away because as the big guy once said we got to be wise like serpents and that's a fact jack can't lose that um another thing i wanted to bring up here well how do i transition out of this i'm not sure it's a good transition it's like going from i don't know classical music to iron maiden uh <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to save it for tomorrow. 
I'll save that for tomorrow. It's a discrepancy as to, as to what's going on with this message. With maybe I'll maybe I'll weave it in like this. One of the things that we're having a hard time with is deception. Deception is is the devil's trade, right? That deception. And so part of one of the things that people are really pushing back against and have been for like the last three years is this whole notion that we're living in a world where there's honesty and truth. And as a result, people are, are you know, tilting at these deceptions, whether it's a flat earth or whether it's a uh, pizza code or whatever it is. I mean, this is what we're engaged in right now. We're engaged in a war against deception. So I was reading uh, the, this, uh, this piece on Steve Scalise and when he was shot. And when Steve Scalise was shot, he was recovering for a very long time. We didn't see Steve Scalise for a couple months, right? Well, some of these kids and people, not just kids, but people who go through these events and get shot, they're magically back on their feet in like two or three days. Oh, what a miracle. Oh, oh, praise Jesus. They're back on their feet. It's incredible. Anyway, Steve Scalise... He got all shot up. Where were the calls for gun control and gun ban and, and all the other assaults on the quote unquote Second Amendment, right? From the left. They just weren't there. But now we have this and all of a sudden it's a it's a cause celeb, right? It's just a level it's an interesting level of deception that I noticed. And uh, a little bait and switch there. Alright, why don't we take a little trip back into time? Did a little time tunneling. Pretty interesting day. I kind of went there before the show. So uh, without... Uh Okay, here we are. We're back in the, in the time tunnel studio, looking back into the past. So I'm, I'm not going to go into a, uh, a lot of lot of depth and detail. I'm just going to try and really pick out a few few interesting little factoids. So in 1939, on this day, there was an erroneous word. It was discovered in Webster's International Dictionary, prompting an investigation. And the word was DORD, D-O-R-D. The word DORD is a notable error in lexicography, an accidental creation, or a ghost word of the GNC Merriam Company's staff in the New International Dictionary. This is back in 1934. Interesting. Philip Babcock Gove, an editor of Merriam-Webster, became editor-in-chief of Webster's Third International Dictionary, wrote a letter to the Journal of American Speech 15 years after the error was caught, in which he explained why Dord was included in that dictionary. On July 31, 1931, Austin and Patterson, Webster's chemistry editor, sent in a slip reading D or D, continue slash density or content slash density. This was intended to add density to the existing list of words that the letter D can abbreviate. The slip somehow went astray, and the phrase D or D, capital D or lower D, was misinterpreted as a single run-together word, DORD. This was plausible. This was a plausible mistake because headwords on slips were typed with spaces between the letters, uh, making a D, capital OR, lowercase d, look very much like DORD. A new slip was prepared for the printer and a part of speech assigned along with the pronunciation. The would-be word was not questioned or cor corrected by proofreaders and it appeared on page 771 of the dictionary around 1934. It appeared between the entries for 
Dorcopsis, a type of small kangaroo, and Dore, golden in color. On February 28, 1939, an editor received, no, received noticed, an editor noticed Dord lacked an entomology and investigated. Hmm. Soon an order was sent to the printer, uh, marked plate change, imperative, urgent. In 1940, bound books began appearing without the ghost word, but with a new abbreviation, although inspection Printed copies well to the 1940s showed Dord still present. The non word Dord was excised, density was added as an additional meaning for the abbreviation D or D as originally intended. In the definition of the adjacent entry Dore furnace was expanded. How about that? The entry Dord was not removed until 1947. All right, today, today was the day that uh, the great Dord mystery was solved. Miriam Webster's funny little thing. Sometimes we need the funny little things in our lives. Uh, 1935, DuPont invented nylon. How about that? Wallace Carruthers, the inventor of nylon. This day, 1935. Just a, a year before, 1939 is when Dord was removed. 1935, four years before nylon was invented. How about that? Pretty cool, huh? Now, from artificial fabric to the fabric of our genetic code. On this day in 1953, James Watson and Francis Crick announced to friends that they have determined the chemical structure of DNA. The formal announcement takes place on April 25th, following publication in April's Nature, published April 2nd. Big day. Big day for fabrics. The fabric of human creation in the fabric of synthetic creation. Both share the same day. How about that? Uh, the first color television went on sale in 1954 using the NTSC standard and offered up for sale to the general public. This day, color TV. It's the birthday of color TV. Pretty good. That's a pretty good day, I guess. If you're into color. We, had a, we had a black and white TV for a very long time. And when we got a color TV, it was really small. It's not a, not a huge, that was huge in our life, but it wasn't a huge uh, well, television. Let's see, the final episode of MASH aired on back in 1983. 106 million viewers, and to this day, there's been a lot of TV happening since then. To this day, holds the record for the highest viewership of a season finale. Not even Friends could top that. And somehow, I doubt... Uh, uh, how I Met Your Mother. I, think, I, I guess that's over now. I don't think you've topped it either. Uh, Olaf Palme was assassinated back in 1986 on this day. Pretty heavy. And then in 1991, the first Gulf War ended. And I'm sure everybody remembers all those great Gulf War parades. Oh boy, weren't they something? Wow, so much celebration. So much honor. Uh, here's a biggie. Where to go? Right there, right there, right there. I just saw it. Where is it? Come on now, come on. Now. 1993. Two years after the Gulf War ends, another war begins. On this day, 1993, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Agents raid the Branch Davidian Church in Waco, Texas, with a warrant to arrest the group's leader, David Koresh. Four ATF agents and six Davidians die. In the initial raid starting the 51 day standoff. So today, 1993, this is when it all kicks off down in Waco. So that's interesting, right? Two years after the Gulf War officially ends, they start up another war. Um, let's see what else. Anything else? I think that's about it. I think that's about it. Uh, Pope Benedict, he resigned five years ago. Pushed out. Absolutely pushed out. Oh, today is uh, the birthday of Bugsy Siegel, the American gangster. He's getting a lot of kind of uh, retro FaceTime with this whole thing down in Florida. There's that whole Florida area between Meyer Lansky and Bugsy Siegel. It's a major kind of crime area for the, uh, for La Costa, what was it, La Costa Nostra. 
like kosher nostra, the kosher nostra, as opposed to the uh, like kosher nostra. Uh, let's see, any other interesting birthdays? Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche, born 1939. How about that? Interesting character. He is the father of crazy wisdom, teaching crazy, crazy, crazy ideas, or trying to get the truth across in radical and crazy ways. <laughs> so he talk about a cult. Okay, this guy was. So he had a bunch of followers in Colorado, in Boulder, of course, that's where Naropa Institute comes out of. And there's an interesting documentary on him. And I actually interviewed the uh, documentary maker, the filmmaker of this documentary, this woman who was a part of the part of the group. And, you know, I could tell she was, you know, still very into the teachings and still very into the people. And, and at that time I was a little bit cynical and, um, was kind of poking fun at it just a little bit but clearly I also wanted to know what was going on what was the skinny so if you watch the documentary I forget the name of it but I but I did a show anyway if you watch it there's a scene where one of the uh, members of the community says to Trungpa you know there's a lot of aggression here there's a lot of aggression in this group so Trungpa uh, picks up on it and says okay we're going to do something about it. So what he does is he gets them to make uniforms that resemble like the Tibetan army. And, and, then, <laughs> and then once the uniforms are made, he has them march and do all these military kinds of exercises. And I was like, you know, that's kind of brilliant, actually. I mean, it's a little, it's a, you know, it's a little culty, but it's also... It's also kind of kind of brilliant in a lot of ways. Uh, let's see. The Andretti brothers are born today. They're twins, Aldo and Mario Andretti, born on this day. And let's see who else. Anybody else interesting? A lot of interesting people born today. A lot of artists. Mike Figgis, the director, he's born today. Bernadette Peters, who I kind of had a crush on when I was a kid. She's kind of cute, Bernadette Peters. Especially when she's in the longest yard. Let's see, anybody else? Cindy Wilson from the uh, B-52, she's born today. Radon Chong, was, yeah, interesting day for, for birthdays. A lot of interesting people. Um, Tommy Toon, the six foot six choreographer, his birthday is today. And I uh, go way back into history. Anybody interesting way back there? Mm. No, not really. Not really. Linus Pauling. Today's Linus Pauling's birthday. There we go. All right, come on. Let's get on back. Let's get on back to 2018. Let's bring it back to the present. Here we go. All right, here we are. It's the 28th of February. God, we haven't got through March yet. Oh. Oh, March is not one of my favorite times of year. I just have to say, I've had, I've had some heavy stuff happen to me in March. My father died in March, so I'm not a big March fan. Although, you know, it's like, yeah, people die, they pass on, it's a day, you know. But a few other things happened in March. And uh, that's when the sun is at the nadir of my chart, down in the fourth house. Uh, deal with all my fourth house fourth housey stuff. Oh boy, lots of fun. Ah, but we move forward, step by step, inch by inch, day by day, breath by breath. And with that. I just want to return to you what I was sharing earlier. Do your best. Do your best to cohere your molecules, cohere your atoms, and bring your heart into a situation where sometimes it's a little bit difficult. And uh, 
and maintain that spirit of what's sacred. Do your best to be a, a carrier of that and a transmission of that in this day, even though it's difficult. You know, just, just stay conscious. Stay conscious and see where you can allow that in. My, uh, my good buddy Steve, who's a big uh, David Sylvian fan. David Sylvian, this is for you. David Sylvian has a great song called Let the Happiness In. Let the Happiness In. I can't play it, though, or else I'll get a strike on YouTube. All right, let's get on out of here. Uh, use your head to discern what's real, your heart to say it when it's possible. I'm Robert Phoenix. I'll be back 24 hours from today. And uh, 